Pope Benedict XVI was forced out of the way by, as Chauncey puts it, uh, his words, not mine, by a globalist strong powers linked to an international Freemasonry. My friends, welcome to this episode of the John Henry Weston Show, which may be one of the most controversial ones I've ever done. Um, I propose to present to you a thesis here, a thesis which should never be considered, except that our times are so crazy. Things that Pope Francis has done over the past 11 years have been so shocking to the Catholic mind that Catholics, intellectual Catholics, academicians, have actually gone there to question the papacy itself, to question Pope Francis if he's really Pope. Now, there's a lot of theories on that. There's very credible theories that uh, people believe, very educated, very studied, and very holy people believe, um, that Francis is not the Pope because um, he was actually not a Catholic going in, or as uh, Archbishop Vigano might say, he didn't intend to... Uh, do what the popes intend to do that's maintain the faith. That's one possibility. There's another possibility that the election was wrong because Pope John Paul II's constitution on the papacy, Universi Domini Gregis, specified the rules for the papacy, and they were violated by the collusion that the San Gallen Mafia uh, undertook, and all of that's real and verified. Um, there's the other possibility that uh, I might call it the Robert Bellarmine thesis, that via heresy, Pope Francis has already abdicated himself from the papal throne. All of those are possibilities. And very good Catholics believe, ascribe to those various ones. There is one other one that, um, and we've discussed some of those here on this show with, with different guests, but there's another one that took off in Italy. Uh, it was by a journalist called Andrea Cianci, and um, it was kind of a fantastical one. It was that Pope Benedict intentionally resigned in a way that wouldn't really be a resignation. It would sort of fake a resignation so as to put himself into a position they call an impeded see. So he wasn't able to function as Pope, but he would still be the Pope. And that would be left to the future to sort of work out and, and uh, it would be providential and so on. A very controversial thesis... I didn't really pay it much mind until, you know, the situation in the church got so crazy. There was actually 30 professors who who wrote about this, considered it seriously, and, and it has some interesting elements to it. I interviewed a very intellectual professor about it, um, you know, and uh, I'll introduce you, him to you in a second. But this thesis, this particular one, wasn't convincing to me, but just there's so many people who believe this. I thought I'd present to you the arguments because the book has been, you know, sold 20,000 copies in Italy and uh, it's it's gone around and around, not received much coverage in America. An interesting thesis, but um, I think the other ones hold more weight. And of course, there's the opposite thesis, and that is of Bishop Athanasius Schneider, who we featured on LifeSite many times. And that is that the Pope is the Pope is the Pope. And there's nothing that can be done to change that, no matter what Francis says or does. Um, it is basically, he's the Pope. The only thing that could ever change that is an ex cathedra statement uh, against the faith, and that won't come. Um, anyway, you've seen all those and more. Check this out on LifeSite News, and please let us know what you think of this thesis in the comments. Stay tuned for this episode of the John Henry Weston Show with not Professor Chianchi himself, but with um, Professor Eric Thaddeus Walters. He's a a doctor of philosophy, a philologist, theologian, and professor of history uh, and Latin at the uh, John Cabot University in Rome. He's lived and studied and worked in Rome for almost 30 years. And Professor Walters, of course, is fluent in English, Italian, Latin, is very familiar with uh, the work of uh, Andrea Cianci and um, was interviewed by the journalist Cianci as well on uh, the YouTube channel of Professor uh, Cianci. So please stay tuned for this episode of the John Henry Weston Show. Professor Eric Walters, welcome to the program. Thank you very much, Mr. Weston. It's a pleasure. Let's begin, as we always do, with the sign of the cross. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, 
and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. So thank you for doing this for us. Um, if we can jump right in, if you can tell us what is Andrea Cianci's point? Well, um, after a three-year investigation, uh, more than 700 articles and uh, 400 podcasts, uh, Andrea Cianci has come to the conclusion that in the declaratio, this is important, not renuntiatio, but declaratio of so-called resignation that Benedict XVI announced. Uh, what he announced was something very different from that which has been understood or presumed thus far. Uh, in a nutshell, the issue is very simple. Uh, Pope Benedict XVI was forced out of the way by, as Chanchi puts it, uh, his words, not mine, but in any event, by a globalist strong powers linked to an international Freemasonry. However, he applied a precise anti-usurpation plan that had been ready since the uh, Codex Iuris Canonicis of 1983, the Code of Canon Law since 1983, uh, with mm, quite profound theological and eschatological implications. Um, he pronounced the Declaratio on March 13th, 2013, or excuse me, on February 11, 2013, rather. Uh, Ingeniously written using Latin and canon law, which, uh, to quote the old form of the Lord's Prayer, or to paraphrase it rather, led into temptation. That is to say, tested his enemies in the Sancta Gallen Mafia, to whom it seemed an abdication. Instead, it was anything but that. Rather, it was a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy, um, similar to Christ's words at the last Passover meal, the Last Supper, uh, one of you will betray me. Better the 16th, with that declaratio, freely offered himself to his own impeded see, and thereby made the anti-Pope Bergoglio, uh, since his illegitimate election, the result of a conclave convened with the Pope, not dead, not abdicating, but impeded. The correct, the correct translation of the Declaratio from Latin was signed by at least three renowned Italian Latinists, including one from the rather famous uh, University of uh, Turin. Okay. Um so for people to understand, what, what do you mean by, or what does he mean by an impeded C? Yeah, gladly. No one talks about it. It's kind of like the elephant in the room. Um, a great taboo of which to speak about. It is the alternative. It's not the same thing. It's the alternative to the sede vacante. That is, when the Pope is not dead and is not abdicated, but is, in effect, uh, a prisoner, exiled and not free to express himself. In fact, uh, one fact, again, under everyone's eyes, kind of the elephant in the room, is that Benedict remained in the sea, dressed in white with all of the uh, pontifical regalia and name, uh, Chonchi suggests, you know, would it even seem possible that the man, Cardinal Ratzinger, Pope Benedict XVI, rather mild and correct, if he had wanted to abdicate, would have remained in the Vatican, dressed in white, to just simply annoy his supposed successor. Chonchi was the first to interpret that declaratio as an announcement and consequently declaratio as it's called, not renunciatio, mm -hmm. as an announcement of a forthcoming impeded sea and not as an abdication. Mm -hmm. So 
how could a pope place himself into an impeded sea? Well, um, in fact, he cannot. Um, and consequently, a rather clever, if not ingenious, um, contrivance of what is referred to as the Roman hour. Uh, Ratzinger, as Pope Benedict declares, I declare that I renounce the mini stadium in Latin so that from the 28th of February, this is 2013, obviously, Ora Vigesima, the Sea of St. Peter, Vaket. By Ora Vigesima, uh, Benedict could also refer to the old traditional papal time, that is Roman time, Italic time, as in ancient Rome, uh, whose hour count begins not at midnight, but at sunset from dusk till dawn, if you are. Right? Mm -hmm. Thus, the Ora Viesima would legitimately coincide with 1 p.m. on March 1st. <laughs> Ratzinger, Pope Benedict XVI, knows, knew that the, the VIS notes, the papal bulletin, always comes out after noon, meaning 12 noon, and before 1 p.m., so that the a convocation of a new conclave would have been illegitimate because it would have occurred with the Pope neither dead nor having abdicated. And so it happened. Uh, the convocation, which actually, actually occurred before the Ora Viesima, was sort of a putsch. That is, better the 16th officially entered the impeded sea, losing his mini stadium. Consequently, 1 p.m., March 1st, is the hour at which he loses that mini stadium, entering an impeded sea. Not a city vacante, an impeded sea. Incidentally, he greets everyone from Castel Gandolfo, famously, where right above his head, is the face of a six-hour Roman italic clock. And this is perhaps the most ingenious thing about Benedict's plan. It does not, it does, however, need some a bit further concentration to be understood. It might be uh, better to see this time pattern to get a clearer overview. Mm -hmm. So we're taking a look at that now on the screen. If you can, if you can tell us, what does uh, Professor Chianci mean uh, when he talks about a, a the Ratzinger code? Yeah. So, um, quite simply, it's not. It's it, it, it obviously it catches the eye, especially in the popular imagination, and especially in the anglophonic uh, world, thanks to a particular author of some note from a couple of decades ago, movies made about it. Um, number one, for everyone viewing or listening, remember, the code of canon law is called the code, Codex Iuris Canonicis. Okay. So it's not meant to, uh, it's, not, it's not supposed to be a, 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 a spy thriller, at least in the fictional sense. Benedict, Pope Benedict XVI used both for the Declaratio, his Declaratio, and in his later years uh, as uh, abdicated, presumable abdicated Pope, the moral theologic concept of the broad mental restriction. It's a way of telling the truth in a very veiled but absolutely logical language to make clear the fact that he has always remained the only Pope. For example, one of the most revealing phrases, I am the first Pope to resign after a thousand years, uh, meaning refer referring to the year 1013. Uh, so too bad that the last abdicator was Gregory the 12th in 1415. So for Ratzinger, the last abdicator, uh, the word resignation is not equivalent to abdication. The reference as Chonchi later discovered with the help of a uh, particular professor, Luca Brunoni, uh, church historian, is rather to Pope Benedict VIII, who in 1013 also made a similar declaration of renunciation 
of the mini stadium without abdicating. Or he said that he kept the white robe because he had no other clothes available. Of course, there's no specific road for an impeded pope. And he remained dressed in white with all the appointments and with the pontifical name. Or, in even easier terms, Benedict continued to impart his apostolic blessing, the exclusive prerogative of the pope, and did so repeatedly for nine years. There was only one pope without ever specifying which one. Hmm. Okay. But isn't it true that Pope Benedict called uh, Pope Francis Holy Nurse, Holy Father, things like that? Yeah, indeed. Just as, exactly as he called Pope, Papa, and Holiness, Theodoros, Theodore II, that is the schismatic Coptic Orthodox Patriarch, Benedict called Francis Pope, because he's a schismatic patriarch, and he called him his successor because as an anti-pope, an impediment, he sits on his throne, albeit illicitly. Uh, one should not stop or end at a superficial aspect that uh, could convince one perhaps to um, believe in a kind of Bergolian uh, language. There's a solid and objective canonical fact, and at a higher level, the subtle statements to be interpreted in broad mental restrictions, as, as it's referred to in the tradition. Right. So, okay, so if this were, if this were true, if this were accurate, how would one get out of it? Mm. Well, According to the Apostolic Constitution Universi Dominici Gregis, which was specifically, specially, and especially prepared by Cardinal Ratzinger under uh, Pope John Paul II in 1996, from the uh, combined provisions of Articles in General 3, and then Number 76 and Number 77, um, Bergoglio is not the Pope and has no rights because the vacancy of the see through renunciation did not occur under Canon 332.2, the Code of Canon Law. In other words, Code of Canon Law is put in place in 1983. And the blueprint for how that is to be handled, how it's to be dealt with, is in UDG, Universi Dominici Gregis of 1996, which requires the explicit renunciation of the MUNOS, M U N U S. And the discourse then on the alleged uh, synonymy, right, as the terms being synonymous between MUNOS and Ministerium, is just an outright deception. The munus means, uh, another word in Latin, you could say uficium, it's an office. Moreover, it's a gift, uh, a spiritual essence, which, as Pope Benedict XVI explains in the Declaratio, must then be exercised, applied with, and in the ministerium. So, the administration, right? Steering Peter's boat and proclaiming the gospel. There's only one case in which the Pope loses the ministerium and still retains the munos. And that is the impeded see, not simply sede vacante, vacancy, but the impeded see. Munos means being Pope. Ministerium uh, means doing pope if you will so much so that in 1988 in the encyclical bonus pastor or pastor bonus the this dichotomy is repeated uh, it's continuously emphasized and not by chance as chonji discovered um sometimes 
<laughs> yeah, munus can also be used, including the meaning of being Pope, but ministerium uh, never means being Pope. And that, that is the ministerium, that's the object of uh, renunciation here. So today it's enough, it's quite simply for the cardinals, who according to Article 3 of the Universi Dominici Gregis, have the duty to intervene, to simply declare that the Pope is dead, very Papa mortus est, and a conclave, a legitimate conclave, must be convened, and that Bergoglio must be sanctioned according to Canon 1375, which sanctions the usurpation of an ecclesiastical office. Okay. So I guess that would explain the the petition that it was promoted by Chianci uh, October 23rd, and it was delivered to the Secretary of State on November the 8th. Yeah. And by the way, it's ongoing. Uh, I think there's currently over 14,000 signatures. The original, they're being done in uh, okay. tranches. So the original uh, petition, there's 11,500 signatures, but now they're also over, I think, uh, I don't know, close to the 5,000. In any event, yeah. So on the eve of St. Mary of Victory, in less than two weeks, they collected 11,500 signatures. And as of November 8th, the church, in other words, for Chonchi, the church, can no longer say, we didn't know. Uh, it's all been protocoled, registered, uh, sealed at the Vatican Secretary of State. Um, for example, a very, or rather famous in Italy anyway, uh, anti-mafia judge, Angelo Giorgiani, and a, a rather prominent uh, association of lawyers called Arbitrium, uh, they participate also in promoting the petition. Um, yeah, it's a point of no return, as Chonchi wrote, and Cardinal Parlin is seems to be already repositioning himself regarding this. It, Cardinal uh, Parlin does. In, in what way is that? Well, um, I think much to Chonchi's surprise, Parlin personally wrote to Chonchi thanking him for sending his inquiry on July 3rd of 2023. Um, he's not expressed himself yet on the petition, uh, but I think one can understand that if the Secretary of State responds rather cordially, and he was not obliged to necessarily, uh, to a journalist who's been claiming for three years that Pergoglio is an anti-pope. Uh, it's a political gesture, at least, of enormous significance. Um, so from this moment on, as far as Chonchi is concerned, the next pope is likely to be the first prelate to denounce the impedency and demand the convocation of a conclave. Uh, that's why he's written a public letter to Bishop Strickland, who, however, has uh, so far been unwilling or unresponsive to consider this petition. Okay. So <clears throat> has John Chi, his thesis been challenged? Oh, yeah. Uh, again, nationally, um, in Italy, most vehemently. It's usually um, he's the object of either indifference or uh, uh, offensive and non-contested, unargued remarks, including pretty much outright insults. Um, the most, um, the theory that's most opposed is that of the substantial error, uh, which maintains that Ratzinger was mistaken because he was influenced by post or conciliar Vatican II uh, modernists. Um, it could be theory. It could be a valid theory in theory because the uh, declaratio is not a valid application. But uh, Chonchi's study, with its analysis of again hundreds of uh, texts and uh, phrases and syntaxes and uh, messages in Ratzinger's code, 
is what's referred to in, in, in moral theology as a broad mental restriction, as well as the implementation, really the perfect implementation of a canonical device that allows the election of Bergoglio to be declared null and void unequivocally demonstrates is that is Ratzinger, that is perfect awareness and strategy in conducting uh, this operation, if you will. Uh, Chonchi's demonstrated that Ratzinger introduced into canon law, that was Ratzinger under obviously Wojtyla, Pope John Paul II, in 1983, the necessity of renouncing the munus, mm, um, which was not necessary before. Uh, so that concept is introduced for the sort of first time in the uh, most recently revised edition of Canon Law in 1993, Canon 332.2, which was not necessary before. So, and then in 1996, the same Cardinal Ratzinger, future Benedict XVI, reiterated the Universi Dominici Gregis in the need to renounce in accordance with that canon. And... Um, the idea for Chonchi is that, and so in 2013, he suddenly forgets what he himself had uh, designed a blueprint <clears throat> of and uh, just renounces the ministerium. In any event, so uh, Benedict was not wrong. He did something so ingenious that in the most superficial way, it appears as a conspiracy, according to a defensive category invented by the CIA in 1967 following the Warren Commission, which is, no one believes any longer. It's been profoundly um, debunked, not to mention overused today, the idea of conspiracy theory. So it takes them less, uh, Chonchi wishes to add that it takes less than half an hour to watch his three documentaries, Diaz Irai, Intelligenti Pauca, and Rede Rationum to get the full picture. And in Chonchi's own words, I hope that uh, LifeSite would one day broadcast them. Mm -hmm. um, so there are other uh, efforts uh, going on. I've, I've talked to a number of people about um, an effort to um, remove Bergoglio and establish that he's not the Pope. What does Professor uh, Chonchi make of those? <laughs> Well, again, in Chonchi's own words, what the traditionalists themselves think, albeit from different voices, um, it's very difficult. It's not impossible, but it's very difficult to depose a heretical or flawed pope, precisely because there is a lack of jurisprudence um, on the matter, notwithstanding, you know, the opinions of Thomas Aquinas, Robert Bellarmine, et cetera, over the centuries. Um, in addition, and, and, you know, to demonstrate any irregularities in the 2013 conclave, kind of word of mouth, what really happened, in a 2013 conclave deemed legitimate uh, that could be remedied by a universal peaceful acceptance. The only viable... According to Chonchi, the only viable and readily available downhill road here is that of the impeded C argument and the finding of nullity, the nullity of the 2013 conclave convened with the Pope impeded as such. Mm -hmm. The 2013 conclave was illegitimate, so neither Bergoglio's heresies, which are manifest, nor Migrelities are actually of any interest. They're basically moot points. The canonical road is paved, therefore. Just tell the truth, says Chonchi. Bergoglio is not the true pope because Benedict never abdicated. The pre-2013 appointed cardinals must simply declare that the pope is dead and a conclave, legitimate one, must be convened. And Bergoglio must be sanctioned according to Canon 13. 75, which sanctions the use of usurpation of an ecclesiastical office. Hmm. Wow. What, um, what else might you say that uh, Professor Chonchi is looking for? Um, 
A would say he does say that uh, the media's support of the whole remaining Catholic world without a critical mass, um, without widespread awareness, it's going to be really difficult for the Cardinals to take action. The risk is that the church will enter another second immediately following impure conclave with all of those Bergoglian named false cardinals and thus continue his anti-papal line of succession devoid of munus and constantly lacking the assistance of the Holy Spirit, which is also mentioned in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, by the way. Hmm. Uh, and consequently, the visible canonical church is in danger of ending forever. First time in history this has ever happened. Um, all Catholics should only care about one thing, therefore, a pre-2013 conclave that can return a legitimate pope to the throne, likable or dislikable, problems, et cetera, included, whatever it may be, but nevertheless endowed with the actual Petrine Munus. And um, finally, uh, Andrea Cholci would like to thank uh, you personally, John Henry Weston and Lifeside News, uh, for this space. And he remains at the complete disposal of all American media who would like to explore this issue further. Interesting. We have a number of other questions, if you wouldn't mind. The, the This distinction between Munus and Ministerium, that was... Um, was that discussed by Catholic theologians prior to 2013, or is it a new concept? Okay, and at this point, I I, I must add, I um I know that um, uh, Chalchi uh, has perhaps uh, added some further feedback, but I've not had an opportunity to visit it. So this is not his words; these are now. This is my commentary, but I do believe that he's would be in agreement uh, with me as we've discussed this uh, rather thoroughly over a long period of time. Uh, yeah, uh, two, two sources in particular, I'll name off the bat, and they're really important because of the chronology involved. The first is quite simply the first 250 words composed of the New Testament, namely the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians, chapter 15, verses 1 through 8, in which Paul introduces the first original kerygma, creed, uh, of the Catholic Church, of Christianity. Um, and secondly, in doing so, uh, the first ecclesiology or structure of the church, the kerygma being, the creed being that Christ died, was buried, was raised from the dead. And the most important fourth point, which the vast majority of theologians either just gloss over or miss completely, is that he appeared. Remember, Paul a Pharisee is a lawyer, well-versed in Mosaic law as well as Roman law. And so he knows exactly what he's doing. He's providing legal precedent and eyewitness testimony for this, if it's all true and real, uh, human species changing uh, revelation. Okay. Christ appeared. And the appearances occur in six points. And this is where he lays out the first ecclesiology then, or structure, of the church. In other words, this is not just neo-testamentary uh, witness, but it's the first thing ever written in the New Testament. The second point comes from uh, Cyprian of Carthage between the years 248 and 258, in the middle of the third century. Uh, when he is the first to introduce uh, terms for the first time in Latin, such as cathedra petri, primatus petri, the unitas ecclesia catholicae, the, the oneness or unity of the Catholic Church, the chair of Peter, the primacy of Peter. The reason why these are significant is, one, you have a not just a neo-testamentary source. It's the first thing ever written in the New Testament, the year 54. First thing ever written. Number two is that with Cyprian of Carthage, uh, we're still 70 years before um, the first Council of Nicaea in 325, the first, regardless of 
debates or the issue, Chris. In other words, this is a mutations of uh, political partisanship, ecclesial partisanship post uh, Constantine. This is well before Constantine ever came on the scene. So these issues were already already resolved. Specifically, uh, forgive this rather a bit roundabout uh, answer to your question, but yeah, regarding the mini stadium and uh, and moon was the difference between the distinction, I should say, uh, between the two. Yeah. Okay, so there's a there's another issue um, that that I found here in his letter of resignation. Bennett the Sixteenth says, and I'll quote it for you: "The See of Rome, the See of Saint Peter, will be vacant, and a conclave to elect the new supreme pontiff will have to be convoked by those whose competence it is." So, how is the claim that he didn't intend to abdicate from the papacy compatible with this statement that he wrote? Yeah, well. Precisely because to whom to whom it's the, the competence is required, meaning the those very same cardinals that up until his time um, had been created as such. So, in other words, the uh, any cardinals created if if the conclave itself in March of twenty thirteen was illegitimate, invalid, then the gravity of the situation is, is, is that serious. Every acta, or I should say actum, all acta uh, carried out since then, including the canonization of John Paul II, are null and void. That's it. And going into a further conclave, which rumor has it, obviously, you know, here in Rome is on the horizon, very brief, short horizon. Um, that means if, if nothing, if this does not change, <clears throat> then we'll have a continuation of this. And that will, in fact, be the end of the at least visible sacramental canonical church now. Yeah. The only thing we'll have left is thanks to St. Augustine and before him, St. Cyprian of Carthage, uh, is baptismal grace. It's that serious, the situation, for anyone who cares. Yeah. <laughs> well, so we are in a situation because Benedict died a year ago. And um, if he was Pope up to his death, what would be the significance of the cardinals whom he appointed, currently stating that Francis is actually Pope. Yeah, um, that that's the conundrum, isn't it? In fact, also, it's an important distinction to be made. The, um, the position of the impeded sea is not, again, it's not the same as the uh, sede vacante, the vacancy. The impeded sea position ends with the death of Benedict the 16th on December 3rd. This is just a matter of academic exercise, okay? Mm -hmm. Ends with the death of Benedict the 16th on December 31st, 2022. And that is when the vacancy vacant C uh, begins. Mm -hmm. I don't know what to say. In fact, that's that's part of Chonchi's um uh interest and design and emphasis on the petition for, in other words, th this is, this is the elephant in the room and it's up to those who are legitimately uh, given the, the only ones legitimately given as per canon law, the, the authority and power to do anything about this is to do something about this. And at the very least to address these glaring, open-ended uh, questions which have not been resolved. Uh, and so you're, kind of, again, kind of a long roundabout answer to your initial question. That is the problem. You know, what, not so much what do they do, what are they doing? 
it would seem to be that everyone is remaining silent, n- unresponsive. Mm-hmm. And, and and finally, do you see a danger of kind of a narrative thinking uh, in the practice of reading hidden messages into statements whose surface meaning seems opposed to them? So that is, um, are we in danger of seeing what we, you know, what confirms a narrative that we have adopted for other reasons rather than just the simpler truth? Well, I think the simpler truth is per- precisely what uh, Chonchi's uh, argumentation is and what we've been discussing. I mean, um, and again, just as a purely academic exercise, mm-hmm. um, Obviously, you know, humans are probably the, that one particular species of animal that looks for patterns as part of self-preservation. It's part of uh, so the survival instinct. You look for patterns. Um, so that's not a bad thing or a negative thing. It's actually part of survival um, and instinct. Um, so much more than looking for clues and answers to resolving such a situation as the one in which the Catholic Church and for that matter the world itself is going through Um, because remember um, for your audience this is of importance not merely or not I should say simply uh, uniquely to uh, a faithful practicing Catholic believer uh, or a Christian believer for that matter, it's even to the interests of an atheist, a non-believer, and anyone that may find themselves in between, because there is a temporal nature to this moon, the office of the papacy. Uh, And a lot of things, obviously, as everyone knows, without going into detail here, uh, currently as we speak on the threshold of the Christmas season 2023 going on in the world. Um, and so this is do or die, not just for the Catholic Church institutionally as such. This is do or die for human civilization, uh, the human race and the human species as as uh, as we've known it. Again, just look at what sorts of statements presumed, again, going back to, do we actually have a real Pope or is it anti-Pope question? Just in the past few days, the statements coming out of Rome and the Vatican regarding a number of issues. Um, So that's, and that's not, you want that, you're, we're not going to undo that spiral unless we go to the starting point. You do not plow a field that is, you do not unweed or uproot weeds in a field by simply mowing the lawn. You do it by uprooting them. So if one does not arrive at the root of the problem, or at least get some debate ball rolling seriously regarding that, you know, the idea that your average local farmer will tell you what happens. Yeah. Indeed. Well, Professor Walters, I want to thank you for your time in uh, expounding to us this controversial uh, yet intriguing thesis that I know has has uh, sold many copies in um, in Italy. But really, I, I don't know that it's it's um, it's been captured yet in the West. So, thank you so much for bringing it to us. Sure, thank you, thank you very much, Mr. Weston, and your crew, your family, and a blessed and merry Christmas to you and yours, and to you. God bless you. And God bless all of you. And we'll see you next time.